Hi everyone. I, I thought about maybe trying some Portugal, but it was probably a bad idea. So I'll, I'll do it in English that, that way at least. I hope everyone can understand me. Okay. Uh, so first of all, thank you, Efrain and Andre, for, for inviting me here. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm enjoying this visit very much. So uh, I'm currently a professor at the University of São Paulo, where we, we work in this uh, quantum thermodynamics and quantum transport group in the physics department. Uh, and today I want to talk a little bit about this idea of the arrow of time. Uh, let's see if this works. Yep, the arrow of time and the quantum realm. So essentially, uh, uh, my my talk will be about these two realms, which are uh, seemingly very distinct. So you have the realm of thermodynamics, where it's, it's um, inhabited by engines and motors and refrigerators and uh, power plants and so on. And you have the quantum realm, the realm of quantum physics, the realm of atoms, uh, and so on. And what I'll try to do is I'll talk a little bit about both both of them. And then I'll try to connect the two, and my area of research is exactly at the boundaries between these two, uh, these two realms, how to connect thermodynamics and quantum mechanics. Okay, so we start with the realm of thermodynamics, and I want to start with uh, uh, a kind of a game. So let's see if this works. I hope everyone can see. Um, I'll play a series of videos, and I want you to guess, is the video playing forward? Or is it, play, is it being played backwards? And I want to see if we can guess if the video is forward and backwards. So let's see if this works. So forward or backwards? <laughs> it's kind of hard, right? OK, so next one. Forward or backwards? Mm. Hard. But now let's see. Let's see this one. Okay. So it's okay, right? You see that this video is clearly, there's clearly a direction of time. Time is going in one way. Let's see a few more. So maybe this one, we see what happens. Again, it's a kind of process that we never see happening, right? And finally, oh, there's two more. Let's see. And finally, this is my favorite. It looks like a sort of superpower from a hero or something. Okay. So clearly, there is a direction of time. OK, so um, the point is that uh, clearly, there are processes in nature for which time has an arrow. Time goes in one way, not in the other way. Right? We see that happening. And there are many other examples of that. One is the free expansion of a gas. If you have a gas, you open up a cylinder. For instance, if you open up a flask of perfume, the mo molecules in the perfume will diffuse, they will never come back in to the, to the flask, right? Uh, the same is uh, for the flow of heat. If you start with a hot body and a cold body, then they will thermalize. They will exchange energy. Energy will flow always from hot to cold. Let's see if this works. Yeah, from hot to cold. This thing is not working very well. Okay. Uh, and another one that we all know is friction. So friction, again, uh, uh, if a block slides with some friction, we know that we dissipate energy and it stops. It never gathers friction to accelerate, right? So uh, this is the idea of the arrow of time. So arrow of time is almost a synonym to what we call the second law of thermodynamics. And this, uh, both of these concepts, they are, what they're telling you is that they're imposing restrictions on what, on what we can do and what we cannot do. They tell you what processes in nature are allowed and uh, what processes are not allowed. I, in the videos we showed, some processes are kind of obvious that they're not allowed. Some processes are less obvious that they're not allowed. And the whole purpose of the second law is to tell you which of these processes are allowed. So th this is by far the most important law in thermodynamics. It essentially tells you what kinds of things you can do and what kinds of things you cannot do. 
Um, but now there's an interesting example. So, so this is a very nice video from a space, uh, SpaceX launch. So just beautiful, uh, perfectly aligned launch. And now if you think about this process, we would never expect the reverse to happen, right? I mean, the reverse would be to get some air and chemicals in the air and then sort of grow together and, and concentrate that air and use its energy to make the rocket go up. We never expect that to happen, right? It is interesting to say that because we do have the, the reverse process, but it's not really the reverse process we expect because the SpaceX rockets, they can land. So it kind of seems like it's the reverse process, but it's not the reverse process, right? The reverse process is something else. This is the rocket actually landing, but this is not the reverse process. The reverse process, so, so we need to understand what is the time reversal. It's not about going up and going down. It's about you dissipating energy to the environment and then you gathering that energy and that is something you cannot do, right? Okay, uh, so then can we reverse the error of time? So yeah, we do that all the time. A refrigerator a air conditioning does exactly that. Uh, uh, the error of time tells you that heat goes from hot to cold, but it, it, when you have a, a air conditioning, it's taking heat from cold to hot. It's taking heat from the inside, which is cold, out to the outside, which is hot. Right? So you can reverse the error of time. We, of course we can. But you have to pay a price. We have to consume a resource. That's the whole point of the business. I mean, you have to use a fuel. You have to use something um, to, to make that happen. So uh, the message, and I think this is perhaps the best message of the second law, is that there is no free lunch. I mean, if you want to do something which is violating the error of time, which is reversing the error of time, you need to pay a price. You need to pay in some kind of fuel, in some kind of resource. Okay, by the way, if you guys have any questions, please interrupt me in the middle. So this is the idea of thermodynamics and of course thermodynamics is very vast but this is the part of therm thermodynamics I would like to to tell you about this idea of the arrow of time and now we move on to the other realm the quantum realm so uh, what I would like to do is, is I want to motivate uh, since the quantum realm is a little bit more distant from us thermodynamics is a little bit more familiar to us I want to motivate a little bit the origins of the quantum mechanics and the origin of quantum physics in general so well the, the quantum realm it, it actually starts in this idea of spectroscopy so a typical spectroscopy experiment goes like this so you have this uh, let's see if oh, this is not working never mind so you have this kind of um, uh, tube which has some gas, neon, uh, hydrogen and so on, you run electricity to it, it emits light. And then you just use a prism to detect what kind of light it emits. And what is very curious about these spectral lines is that uh, each gas only emits in a finite set of frequencies. So it's only a finite set. Uh, this, for instance, are the spectral lines for hydrogen. Hydrogen will emit light into these wavelengths and only these ones, no other. Um, this is a more complete set of spectral lines for hydrogen, uh, mercury, um, neonium, and so on. So you have that each element emits in a very specific and very well-defined set of uh, lights. So this is the, how these neon signs work, right? Uh, so each of the colors in a neon sign is related to one kind of gas. So red is neon, blue is, I think, is xenonium, I, I don't remember. But each, each gas will have a specific color. And um, uh, this is the basic principle of these kinds of uh, neon signs. It is also the basis, and I think this is very interesting, it's the basis of radio telescopes. So when you hear that, you know, well, there is hydrogen in some star far away, how do we know it's hydrogen there? We know because of this, because hydrogen emits in exactly these numbers. So if we point a telescope in these numbers and we see something emitting exactly in this number, we are sure it's hydrogen. It's not going to be any other chemical element. So these numbers, they are a signature of the element, right? So they're very sharp and they function as a signature. And that is the basis of all radio astronomy. Uh, um, it's, it's still nowadays. We just focus our telescope on a given uh, wavelength and we see if that uh, part of the galaxy is emitting in the wavelength we're looking for and that way we can tell what are the elements in different parts of the galaxy. That is, that is quite, quite remarkable. So, um, but it's also quite weird. Um, I mean, I, I find it quite weird because it's, it's something that is discrete. Uh, and if you think about what we learn in mechanics, in electromagnetism and so on, everything is continuous. 
everything we can change continuously. If you want to change the energy of a little girl in a swing, you can change that energy continuously. You can just give very tiny push, pushes, and you can change the energy of, uh, or the amplitude of uh, oscillations. Everything is continuous. It oscillates and it can grow and it can be uh, reduced continuously. And when you talk about spectral lines, we have something which is completely discrete. So this was historically the first example of something that is discrete. And discrete is very strange. In our world, there are very few things which are discrete. Most of the things around us are continuous. Um, what's quite interesting is that uh, the first explanation to these spectral lines came in 1885 uh, with Johann Baumer. And this is quite nice. He was a, he was a high school teacher in uh, Sweden. Uh, in Switzerland, sorry, in Switzerland, and Baumer, he really liked patterns. So he just liked to look at patterns and search for mathematical patterns. And he saw these numbers, these numbers that we showed before, 656, 886, 434, blah, blah, blah. He just looked at these numbers and kept trying to find a pattern. Is there a pattern between these numbers? And quite interesting, there is. So the pattern is this. One over the wavelength is some ugly number like this, times 1 over 4 minus 1 over n squared. So he found this out of just trial and error, just looking for patterns and trying to see what he could find. And so this is now known as the Balmer series of hydrogen because it explains a series of transition lines. So there are a series of, um, of these transitions, of these uh, spectral emissions, which are explained by Johann Balmer. Uh, a refinement came with Bohr. 1912, so Bohr published what was a very, very important model in physics. And uh, the idea of Bohr's model is this. He said, look, if you think about hydrogen, for instance, it has a proton and it has the electrons. And the, uh, the, uh, there are two rules. Rule number one, the electrons, they live in stable orbits, but these orbits are discrete. The electron cannot be in here. No, never. He'll either be here in this orbit or in this orbit or in this orbit. The orbits are discrete. So if you compare this to a satellite, for instance, it's very different. We can place a satellite anywhere we want, any radius from the Earth we want. We just decide the radius, we put it there. With an electron, no, you cannot do that. Either the electron is on this orbit or that one or that one and so on. The orbits are discrete. So this is what Bohr said. He just said that. I mean, he didn't show that. He just said, look, this is, I wanted the world to be like this, right? Uh, and the electron can also jump from one orbit to the other. So he can also jump around. So he has a bunch of orbits. He can keep jumping around. But every time he does, uh, the electron does so, uh, it will either emit or absorb a photon. So this, the light that we see, the emission, uh, that we see in these neon signs are ultimately related to these transitions. Every time an electron goes up and down, it emits or absorbs a photon, and that's why we see the neon sign shining. And so you, can, you have this kind of diagram. So you have several series. So you have Baumer over there, and you have all these series related to the different orbits. So this is orbit number one, this is orbit number two, this is orbit number three, and so on. And, and there can be transitions between uh, these different orbits. So this was 1912, uh, and a bunch of people cr criticized the Bohr model, a bunch of people liked it. It was controversial, but it was not so fundamental, and everyone knew that. Of course, Bo Bo Bohr just said that it should be like this. He didn't show he didn't show why and why nature should be like this and so on. And the model was also very limited. I mean, he just did this for hydrogen and that's it. You couldn't do anything else. So even though Bohr's model does explain the spectral lines, it was not completely satisfactory. It was not the whole story. Uh, and then things changed again in 1926. So 1926 came Schrodinger uh, with his famous equation, and this is where things really took off. So this is a, a, the first few lines of Schrodinger's uh, first paper in 1926, and, and I, I think it's very nice to read it. So let's see. Uh, in this paper, I wish to consider first the simple case of the hydrogen atom. Uh, and so he's considering exactly the same problem we are, exactly the same setting, and show that the customary quantum conditions, so customary quantum conditions, he means Bohr's model, the, the transitions, can be replaced by another postulate in which the notion of whole numbers, this idea of discreteness, uh, merely as such is not introduced. So this is kind of a criticism to Bohr, it's not introduced, meaning I'm not introducing this by hand, I'm not postulating this, I'm just, I'm going to show this. Rather, when integral does appear, it arises in the same natural 
natural way as it does in the case of the node numbers of a vibrating string. So he made here a connection between uh, particles and waves. He said, look, there's a connection with these uh, harmonics of a vibrating string. The new conception is capable of generalization and strikes, I believe, very deeply at the true nature of the quantum rules. So these are, I think, are very, very beautiful, um, very beautiful words. So when, when Schrodinger wrote this, he already had almost ready three other papers doing a bunch of other stuff. So, so this part, uh, I believe, is capable of generalization. Uh, he already knew that, so he already had generalized. Um, and so Schrodinger's equation um, was a success. It was perhaps in, 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 at least in physics, I cannot really tell uh, for other sciences, but at least in physics and chemistry, this was really a revolution. 1926, it was everything changed that year because it was an instant success. There were so many applications. One could use this idea of Schrodinger to solve so many, but so many problems. So here there's some problems related to atoms, related to particles and, and so on, but you can also solve all of chemistry. So you guys probably know Linus Pauling. We learned in high school this Pauling diagram and so on. Uh, Linus Pauling, he was a, a brilliant guy, very brilliant. But he was also a guy that was at the right place at the right time with the right skills. He was exactly looking for ways to apply physics to chemistry and almost no one else was doing that. They used to feel that chemistry and physics were different things. And he was a guy that was trying to connect but didn't have the tools. He didn't know how to connect. And when Schrodinger appeared with this equation, I mean, for him it was perfect. He just applied Schrodinger's theory and he solved all of chemistry. If you look at Pauling's papers, publications, by starting 1927 all the way up to 1932, he explains everything, every chemical bond, the structure of the atoms, the structure of the periodic table, everything. He explains everything. 1932, he writes a book, which is still nowadays one of the best books in chemistry, 1932. Just he, he, he's done. He finished chemistry. So it's quite remarkable. I mean, the amount of applications that quantum theory had were, were quite remarkable. Um, the same thing is true for high energy physics. So uh, all of our, our, our understanding of particle physics, of fundamental particles, uh, protons, neutrons, and the stuff that's inside them, like quarks and so on, that's all also coming from quantum theory. Um, Condensed matter, solids, so this is a superconductor, so it's a, a superconduct this is a magnet and this is a superconductor that is levitating on top of it. This is explained by quantum mechanics as well. You can use quantum theory to explain not only magnetism, and, but also superconductivity. And superconductivity is very important uh, nowadays for many applications like uh, MRI scans and so on. So that can also be explained by quantum mechanics. And also, um, there are also tons of applications of quantum mechanics. So this is a, this is a typical chip. Uh, the, every ingredient in a chip is essentially uh, was discovered due to quantum mechanics. The transistor, the basic, the underlying unit of a chip, the transistor is quantum. It, if we didn't know quantum mechanics, we would have never have discovered the transistor. Um, so quantum mechanics, this was 1950s, it was already giving very, very important uh, applications. Uh, however, quantum mechanics is also very weird. Uh, so it's also very, very strange. Um, if, you, if you work through the theory, you'll see that it's very counterintuitive. The, the, it, it feels very strange. I think there's, let me see if I put, yeah, I put it here. There's even this very nice sentence uh, by Richard Feynman, which says, if you think you understand quantum mechanics, you don't understand quantum mechanics. And I think this sentence is true. I completely agree. It's very strange theory. So, um, it, in a sense, uh, for m almost a century, we've been applying quantum mechanics to understand stuff. But we didn't really bother trying to understand quantum mechanics itself. It's kind of weird, you know? We, we, we apply this theory. It's very easy to apply quantum mechanics. You want to apply quantum mechanics to chemistry? Fine. You just go, you write stuff down, you get an answer. But to actually understand quantum mechanics is very hard. To really have a, a, a deep understanding of this. Uh, so, so let me tell you about two of these quantum weirdness, uh, two, two, two basic uh, features. The first one is this idea of superposition principle. So in quantum mechanics we also have bits. A bit is either zero or one, and in quantum mechanics we have a qubit, um, which is also zero and one. But the difference between a bit 
and a qubit is that in a qubit you can be simultaneously in 0 and 1 and that's the big difference so that's the the whole business of quantum theory you don't have to be in 0 or in 1 you can be at both at the same time and come on that is super strange I mean you can be at two configurations at the same time it would almost be the same as saying that you can be in two places at the same time it's essentially the same thing you can simultaneously be in 0 and in 1 uh, so, in, in a certain sense, it's, uh, p some people argue that quantum mechanics is like a parallel computing by design. You're always working in parallel because you don't have to do a computation for zero and a computation for one. You can also do, always do a computation for both zero and one at the same time. So, it's kind of a similar field to parallel computing uh, in this sense. But there's now this very no strange notion of measurement. So, when we say that a qubit is simultaneously in 0 or 1, what we really mean is that it's not in 0 and it's not in 1. It's not defined. The state of the qubit is not defined. It's 0 and 1 at the same time. But if you do measure it, you'll find it in 0 or in 1. And, and then afterwards, it will be in 0 or in 1. So, so this actually enters into um, a realm which is almost philosophy, which is this notion of realism. So, so realism is this idea of whether a property is defined independent of observation. So you say a rose is red, it doesn't matter if you want to look at the rose or not, the red is a property of the rose, the rose is red, it doesn't matter what you do to it, it's a property of the rose. Uh, with quantum systems that is not true, a qubit is not in zero or in one, it will only decide on a, a state to collapse if you do a measurement, if you measure it, then it will go either to zero or to one. Otherwise, it is undefined. Right? And that is super strange. I mean, this is, it's kind of mind-blowing to think about these things. Right? Uh, the other uh, very strange and perhaps the most uh, popular concept is this idea of entanglement, quantum entanglement. So, first of all, quantum entanglement I think is very interesting because if you type on Google images, quantum entanglement, qu quantum entanglement, you'll see a bunch of images which are almost exactly like this one. And these images, they don't mean anything, right? These, these images, these drawings, they don't mean anything. They're artistic renditions of something, but there's no meaning here. It's just artistic rendition. Uh, and I think that's funny because quantum entanglement is something that you cannot draw. You cannot draw it. You cannot make a drawing of quantum entanglement. It's impossible. It's really something which is a mathematical concept that has physical realizations, but it's, something, it's not something that we can have a mental picture of what it is. And what entanglement means, entanglement is a kind of correlation. Correlation means if you do something to one guy, it, you learn something about the other guy. That's what correlation means. So a typical kind of experiment would have Alice and Bob uh, and you produce an entangled pair of particles. You produce, for instance, two entangled photons. And then you send one to Alice's lab and one to Bob's lab. Maybe they're in different labs in different cities or something. You send one there, one there. And then Alice makes a measurement. So if Alice makes a measurement, she will find either zero or one. It's a bit, so she will find one of the two possibilities. If she didn't do the measurement, then Bob's qubit could be either 0 or 1. But if she do, did, does the measurement and finds 0, then Bob's qubit is for sure 0. That's the idea of entanglement. So if she doesn't do anything, Bob's qubit can be 0 or 1. But if she does something, it immediately changes the state of Bob. It immediately collapses. So that's a kind of correlation. If she does something here, it immediately affects the other state there. But this is weird, because this can be done even if they're on different planets or different galaxies. So, this actually caused a lot of concern by some very important people like Einstein who said, look, this is uh, violating causality. You can use this to send messages faster than the speed of light. So, there's something very wrong here. Uh, and it, it is very strange. It turns out that we cannot use this to send messages faster, faster than the speed of light. Unfortunately, um, this cannot be done. But this is true. This kind of effect is true we can actually show in the lab that this kind of phenomenon is not a, 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 a very strange prediction of the theory. This is the truth. This is actually what happens in nature. So, so you have all these kinds of strange things. Um, 
Yeah, in fact, Einstein called this a, a spooky action at a distance. So he, he named entanglement spooky action at a distance. And so the point is that this, that, right? Uh, you cannot use this for superluminal communication. It would be great if, if we could use this, right? It would be very nice, but we cannot, unfortunately. So this leads us to this idea of quantum technologies 2.0. So why 2.0? Because there are a bunch of quantum technologies that already exist. The transistor is a quantum technology. The laser is a quantum technology. The nuclear magnetic resonance is a quantum technology. Um, however, especially after the 80s and so on, people started realizing that uh, you can have uh, certain systems where you can have a lot of control over these weird things. Stuff like entanglement, you couldn't control it uh, in the 50s. In the 50s, people couldn't really play with entanglement and increase the entanglement and reduce the entanglement and so on. But now we can. Now we can actually have two particles and we can just pre press buttons and control how entangled they are. So we now have control over these new effects, control over these new quantum features. And so that's why we call it quantum technologies 2.0, because we are referring to new technologies technologies that use entanglement to do something useful. So um, one of them that I'll talk a bit more in a second is the idea of quantum sensors. We can actually make sensors that are much more precise. Well, well in fact, we, we all know one sensor, the atomic clock. The atomic clock was the first quantum technology 2.0. It's uh, the most precise kind of clock in the world. We also have quantum communications. You can do communications uh, uh, um, with an encryption that is unbreakable. It's, it's for, for sure impossible to, to, to break the encryption. And you also have this guy, which is quantum computing. So this is the IBM quantum computer. Uh, and we can do algorithms which are uh, exponentially faster um, and which can solve problems that we can not even think about solving with present day computers. So uh, we have all these ideas for these quantum technologies. Uh, that can be done using entanglement. So if we can harness entanglement, if we can have control over entanglement, we can actually uh, do quite interesting things. Some of these technologies are far in the future. So a quantum computer is now in, really in, in its early stages. Uh, it's, uh, quantum computers nowadays, they don't solve problems exponentially faster than current computers. Right? Nowadays, quantum computers are not very good yet. They will be in the future, but they're still in, the, in their infancy. But we do have some quantum technologies uh, which are already appearing in the market. So, and the number of startups which are appearing, uh, uh, which label themselves as quantum technologies, is really growing uh, exponentially fast. So this is one of my, my favorites called QSpin. Um, this is a company in the US that's making uh, these sensors, these tiny sensors. They're, they're magnetic field sensors. They can sense magnetic fields. Uh, they're more precise than any other sensor that ever existed. And all other sensors that ever existed, the good ones, they required you to go to liquid helium temperatures, very, very low temperatures. This one is ambient temperature. You can just use it ambient temperature. Super tiny, costs very little. Uh, right now it's around $1,000, but it can go down, of course, with time. It's the, tech, the, the things inside are super simple, just some lasers and so on. And this is the most sensitive sensor for magnetic fields by at least one order of magnitude compared to the best predecessor. So one order of magnitude. And so, for instance, one of the very interesting things that they are doing with this is these funny helmets. So this is the idea of using magnetic fields to measure brain image. This is happening, this is from the University of Nottingham. So the idea is that they, they put a, a helmet with a bunch of these sensors and every time your neurons emit something, it uh, uh, generates a magnetic field. And so if you can model the magnetic field that your brain is emitting, you can actually model the brain dynamics. And this is super cool because brain, there are many diseases which you cannot detect with brain images. Schizophrenia, for instance, if you do a schizof uh, MRI scan of a schizophrenic patient and a healthy patient, it's the same. It doesn't, a, a image doesn't tell you anything. You need a video. Schizophrenia is about, about brain dynamics. It's about how the, the neurons propagate the signals. And so with these kinds of things, they can actually monitor in real time uh, the evolution of a brain. And this is quite remarkable. This is happening right now, in, in not only in Nottingham, but also in other places. 
So I'm just saying all this uh, to tell you that this idea of quantum technologies 2.0 is something that is really exploding and uh, it's not only potential applications, these are real applications that are already uh, here to stay. Um, okay, so finally I would like to, to get to this uh, part of my talk where I uh, say a little bit about my research which is to connect these two realms. So how can we connect quantum thermodynamics, uh, thermodynamics with quantum mechanics? Uh, what I would like to show you is one experiment. So this experiment is, uh, wait, sorry, yeah. So it's this one. It was done in Rio uh, in collaboration with some groups in Sao Paulo, ABC, uh, uh, Santo André, which is a city near Sao Paulo. Also some people from uh, Germany as well. So here's the idea. L let me show you the picture. Here's what we want to do. We want to actually use entanglement. We want to use quantum correlations to reverse the arrow of time, to reverse the flow of heat. So if you have the usual arrow of time is like that up there, you have hot and cold, they interact and then they become warm and warm, right? So you have hot and cold, you make them interact, they go like this. This would be the usual kind of um, thermodynamic scenario. Now if you want to have hot and cold to actually become hotter and colder, you have to use some resource. We discussed this, we, you have to burn some fuel, you have to burn something. What we want to show is that entanglement actually functions as that kind of fuel. We can actually use entanglement to make the heat flow from cold to hot, to reverse the error of time, exactly like an air conditioning would do. And so here's what we do. The experiment is done in these uh, magnetic resonance setups. So we have this uh, tube which has a liquid and in this liquid you have a very special sample which is this, um, it's um, uh, how, how, how do you call this in English? Uh, chloroformium molecule, sorry, chloroformium molecule. Um, but, but which is a special molecule because the carbon here is an isotope. So it's not carbon uh, um, 12, it's carbon 13, right? Um, and so this gives you two qubits. So the nuclear spin of hydrogen is one qubit and the nuclear spin of the carbon uh, uh, is another qubit. So you have actually two qubits. So uh, two, two guys that can be zeros and ones. And one will function as one qubit, zero and one. The other one will function as the other one. And we can do stuff with these guys by applying magnetic pulses. So we, we have magnetic fields that we can apply in all directions. And these magnetic fields, they can simulate any kind of system interaction. So we have these kinds of circuits and so on. And so here's the results I want to show you. Uh, so this is the only plot we have to look at today. So this is flow of heat. Uh, this curve, let's start with the blue one. This is the usual curve when they are uncorrelated. So here I'm talking about heat flow leaving the hot guy. So leaving the hot guy means that the energy is going down. So the hot guy starts with high energy, energy is going down. It's cooling. So going down means cooling, right? Now, if we use entanglement, we get this guy. And so you see that the hot, the hot qubit is actually heating up. So instead of cooling, whenever you have entanglement, you're consuming entanglement to make the heat uh, go up. And we can actually show this by computing the entanglement. So this is the correlation. You see that as this guy goes up, it's consuming this guy. So this guy goes down. So you burn the resource, you burn this guy, to make heat flow from hot to cold. Now, of course, um, what does this mean? Well, uh, as we discussed, the second law, it will determine what kind of processes are allowed and what kind of processes are not. And if we want to break the arrow of time, we have to consume resources. So essentially, the message here is that entanglement is a resource. We can actually use entanglement as a resource to perform thermodynamic tasks. Uh, whether this is useful or not, that is a very important question. Uh, it's not clear yet. Uh, we don't know. Uh, but it's interesting to, to see that we have here a new kind of resource, um, which is n not an energetic kind of resource. It's an informational kind of resource. And that's, that is quite, quite, quite peculiar, right? I mean, we have a, a resource which is really correlations, correlations and quantum correlations as a resource. Um, 
And of course, uh, uh, for sure, these are just two spins, two very tiny particles. So indeed, this is not r really something that you can use to you know, transfer heat from a bucket of water to another bucket of water. That is completely true. Uh, however, this is just a proof of principle that, uh, in principle, entanglement is a resource. It can be consumed for a thermodynamic task. Um, I thought this was quite re quite interesting. So, so a month ago, uh, t two months ago almost, um, this institute, so FQXI, is, is an institute uh, made of, um, 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 how do you call this, donors from many countries, so, so the rich people that like to donate to science. Um, they open calls for foundational questions. So you want, they want to give money for people to study uh, questions which are fundamental and so on. And the call they opened this year is exactly what we talked about. Informa the, the, the name of the call is uh, Information as Fuel. So it's exactly to investigate this kind of process and how can one use quantum correlations and information in general as a kind of fuel. So this, I thought it was quite interesting that um, you have a lot of people investing in this kind of problem. Uh, so to finish, I would like to show you a movie, if you allow me. Um, so let's see, can everyone see here? Should we turn the lights a little bit down? Is it good? Yeah, back there, you, can, you guys can see. Girasse ao contrário, o dia começaria de noite. O sol nasceria no oeste. As pessoas comemorariam o ano velho. O futuro seria passado. A vida começaria nos cemitérios. Os idosos seriam os mais jovens. casais voltariam a se desconhecer. O primeiro beijo seria o de adeus. O lixo seria matéria-prima. Criaríamos a própria comida. As folhas voltariam para as árvores. E as árvores voltariam para a terra. Se o mundo girasse ao contrário, o fogo seria restaurador. Armas curariam os feridos. Pena de morte seria a salvação. E a punição seria viver. A essência precederia a existência. O nível máximo acadêmico seria o jardim de infância. As creches seriam os asilos, onde esqueceríamos tudo o que se viveu. E a felicidade seria a mais simples.
se o mundo girasse ao contrário, eu não precisaria me preocupar, pois já saberia todo o amor que iria ter. Meu único lamento seria saber que eu vou esquecer o seu rosto. Se o mundo girasse ao contrário, os homens sairiam das cidades. Os livros voltariam a ter páginas em branco. Todas as fronteiras acabariam. Jesus desceria da cruz. Se o mundo girasse ao contrário, o homem seria extinto. A terra viraria poeira estelar. O universo desapareceria. Afinal, existe vida antes do nascimento. First of all, this movie was made by a, a, a cinema student in University of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, he had no idea about quantum physics at all, or about anything like that. I talked to him. He, I mean, he just made a movie that he thought was fun. Uh, but he, this movie was actually, uh, it entered into something called the quantum shorts, which are short movies about quantum mechanics that the um, Science Museum in Singapore has every year. And that's where I found this movie. I didn't even found it in Brazil. I found it all the way. <laughs> across the globe in Singapore. Uh, but I thought it was a very good movie because it really illustrates this idea of the arrow of time. And I don't know if you noticed, but it alternates, the movie alternates between scenes where you can see the arrow of time and scenes where you cannot. There are some scenes that, like the waves, you cannot really tell if it's forward or backwards, and some of them you can. So you're always playing uh, with this kind of game. Okay, so this is essentially what I had to say. Um, so thank you very much. And again, thank you for inviting me.